starts right now. Breaking today, the impeachment investigation expanding the new subpoenas, now even targeting the Pentagon as House Democrats try to get the full story on President Trump leaning on Ukraine for election help. The sounds of silence, why so many Republicans are refusing to step up and st say that the president asking foreign powers to investigate his domestic, domestic political opponents is just wrong. But the president's biggest defender in the Senate is slamming his decision today to pull troops out of northern Syria. Top Republicans now fearing the move is going to leave allies to die and is a gift to Russia. Welcome to The Lean, I'm Jake Tapper. We start today with our politics lead and the strategy of the White House and its allies of spinning, dismissing, and outright lying to the American people on full display today as the impeachment investigation expands and Democrats slap brand new subpoenas on the Trump administration. Today, the three House committees leading the charge on impeachment, intelligence, oversight, and foreign affairs, subpoenaed both the president's defense secretary and his budget chief, not only demanding documents about President Trump's interactions with Ukraine and his withholding of hundreds of millions of dollars in military aid for Ukraine, but also information on the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and the ways in which Giuliani pressured Ukrainian officials to investigate Joe and Hunter Biden on behalf of President Trump. CNN's Caitlin Collins kicks off our coverage now from the White House. As House Democrats ramped up their impeachment inquiry today by issuing new subpoenas for the Pentagon and Budget Office, President Trump tried to turn the firestorm around on them, accusing House Speaker Nancy Pelosi of treason, insisting she's the one who should be removed from office, not him, though members of Congress can't be impeached. The president is shifting his defense, still insisting that call with the Ukrainian president was perfect but now claiming it was Energy Secretary Rick Perry who urged him to call Vladimir Zelensky. Absolutely. I asked the president multiple times, Mr. President, we think it is in the United States and in Ukraine's best interest. Perry says it's true he wanted Trump to call Zelensky about energy, not the Bidens. Not once, not once. As God is my witness, not once was a Biden name not the former vice president, not his son, ever mentioned. The energy secretary wasn't on the July call at the center of the impeachment probe, but Democrats may still want to talk to him. In addition to the new subpoenas for the Pentagon and budget office today about that hold on the Ukrainian military aid package, two more key witnesses are expected to testify this week. The president spent the weekend firing off dozens of tweets as Republicans struggled to defend his actions. When I asked the president about that, he completely denied it. He adamantly denied it. He vehemently, angrily denied it. He said, I'd never do that. Not a single White House official went on television Sunday, leaving the task up to Republican lawmakers who struggled with this shaky defense. You really think he was serious about thinking that China's gonna investigate uh, the Biden family? Even the White House hasn't claimed Trump was kidding when he suggested China should investigate the Bidens. Uh, I don't honestly know. Now, Jake, CNN has also confirmed that during a senior staff meeting last week, the chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, predicted if President Trump does get impeached by the House that he will win 45 states in the 2020 election. It was a statement that surprised some officials in the room, and that's confirming Axios reporting, but also follows CNN reporting that President Trump had been sensitive to the ideas that they were forming some kind of an impeachment response inside the White House. Conversations that we should note Mick Mulvaney was a part of. All right, Kaylin Collins at the White House, thanks so much. Let's chew over all this with our experts. Chairman Rogers, let me start with you. You led the House Intelligence Committee. Part of the subpoena for the Secretary of Defense includes documents related to President Trump's call with the Ukrainian president and, quote, the identity of all individuals who listened to, participated in, assisted in preparation for, transcribed, took notes during, reviewed the call record or transcript, or received information, unquote. So break that down for us. What are the Democrats looking for here? Well, they're going to try to substantiate what exactly happened on the call. Remember, the, the part that was released uh, was someone's interpretation of the call. It was not a transcript of the call. So they're going to look for the transcript and they're going to talk to people around the call. Was that when you first had any suspicion that something was funny going on? Is that all of that is going to happen? And my guess is that list was generated 
because of the conversations with the whistleblower, candidly. Mm -hmm. So that whistleblower likely gave names of somebody that fits those descriptions, uh, and that subpoena includes who the whistleblower believed would have further information and probably supported the whistleblower's complaint, would be my guess. And Jen, we have a second whistleblower now, according to Mark Zaid, who's the attorney for both the second and the first whistleblower, and he says this whistleblower also went to the intelligence mm -hmm. community, Inspector General, uh, and has first-hand knowledge, mm -hmm. did not file a separate complaint, he doesn't right. need to, or, mm -hmm. or she doesn't need to, uh, it's uh, part of the original complaint, but, but backs it up. Right, and I think, as, as Mike was saying, as much as they can make this about putting together the facts and the details of exactly what happened, it becomes less about the personality of the, the whistleblower. I think Democrats are assuming uh, that the whistleblower's name will become public. I mean, we certainly hope not, but that will likely happen, and it will become a character assassination um, effort against them. But if there are multiple people, which there seem to be, that seems to be building, who are putting together all these details, who are firsthand witnesses, who have uh, specific details of the relationships, the conversations with Giuliani, the call, it becomes less. It, it becomes much more challenging to make this a character assassination against the whistleblower. And, and Elliot, Democrats are also demanding documents from the Pentagon that have to do with the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and whether he pressed Ukrainian officials to investigate, among other things, quote, matters related to Burisma Holdings, that's the uh, gas company that where Hunter Biden was an advisor, Paul Manafort, Hunter Biden, Joseph Biden, the Democratic National Committee, Hillary Clinton, and or any U.S. persons or entities. Democrats also warning they might subpoena three of Giuliani's associates if they don't cooperate. So they're really going after Rudy right now. Right, because we, and we've talked about this before. We just don't know what Rudy Giuliani's role has been. Is he private citizen? Is he State Department envoy? Is he attorney to the president? And he's trying to hide behind his relationship as an attorney with the president to get out of having to submit documents. But a lot of these are getting at the fact that, look, Rudy Giuliani is a core figure in this, that um, going back to um, a number of ties to Ukraine and so on. And so uh, it is very much in their interest to see what they can find out of him. And it's very narrowly tailored. What you read there isn't a scattershot request of documents from Rudy Giuliani. They've um, They've iterated everything that they need from him, and they're just going to see what turns up. And Rudy Giuliani has been out there with a lot of unsubstantiated allegations. Uh, at the beginning, it seemed as though people like Secretary of State Pompeo and others, uh, Attorney General uh, Barr, were telling reporters off the record or having aides tell them off the record that they were really annoyed with what Rudy was doing. But now it seems as though all these administration officials are kind of following Rudy down this rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting. I certainly think that it's interesting to watch how Pompeo has reacted to this because, yeah, you didn't really get a sense up until this moment that Mike Pompeo and Rudy Giuliani were in lockstep on what was going on and the idea that Rudy Giuliani was going to kind of be some State Department envoy. But the way Pompeo has responded, the way he's gotten his back up, he's bristled at these requests, I think uh, does kind of put him right in line with the president, right in line with Rudy Giuliani. It is telling. That's not how everyone across this administration has responded, but it certainly tells you where Mike Pompeo is in all of this. Elliot, because it centers around President Trump's phone call, can the, can the White House make any sort of legal case against turning over any of these documents, executive privilege or whatever? They're going to try. Now, look, the president of the United States is entitled to some space of executive privilege around conversations that are core to the, the functions of the presidency or whatever. But they've really expanded the definition of executive privilege going back to the beginning of this administration, to the, to the first days, that almost anything. Rudy Giuliani has claimed executive privilege even though he's not even a White House employee. Now, the interesting thing here is that they are flirt the administration is flirting with another impeachment article for obstructing the mm -hmm. inquiry if they don't you know, if, if it's found that they that their claims of privilege are lawless or if they've gone too far, then you know, the Congress can just file another uh, article of impeachment mm -hmm. for obstruction. And, and, and Congressman Rogers, what do you make of uh, Axios reported and CNN has confirmed that, that Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney has said that if impeachment goes forward, it will be good for him. He could end up winning 45 states in the 2020 election. Um, do, do a lot of Republicans think that? <clears throat> No, but I, I will say that outside the bubble of Washington, D.C., people are exhausted by all of this. Uh, and if they're not tuned in, they think it's political. 
And I think you're, you're seeing that. I saw a clip on CNN where a Democrat member went back and was getting guff from her constituents. That's going to happen. The same way Republicans go out and say, no, this is all political. Help me get reelected to fight this cause. People rally to that. So I don't think this is as granular. It's as granular for everyone at this table and a lot of people inside D.C., but people who are worried about getting their kids on the bus and trying to make sure they have a job, like a lot of people are in Michigan today, it doesn't have that same weight. It's a partisan fight, not a substantive fight. Until that changes, I think people, uh, it will have an impact on politics I'm not sure it'll turn out the way Mick Mulvaney predicts, <laughs> uh, but I do think it's going to have a political impact before if, it even has a thing, substantive impact. If what you're referring to is the Alyssa Slotkin uh, point. Another where, Michigander. Yeah, another, another Mich Michigander. Alyssa Slotkin did raise the point she got some flack, but when she said something about standing up for her oath of office, she got 25 <laughs> seconds of applause from the audience. So people do, yes, there's the partisan element of this, but people do also want to know that the members of Congress who don't swear an oath to constituents, they swear an oath to protect the Constitution. And, that, and let me just say, volume. town halls, and I've been through <laughs> lots oh, yeah. and lots and lots of them, uh -huh. are hardly indicators of where you're yeah, elected. Fair People no, I... come there because they're angry, or very rarely do they come there because they're really happy. All right, everyone stick around. We're going to talk more about it. Yeah. Uh, then there were four. A fourth Senate Republican just spoke out about President Trump asking China and Ukraine to investigate the Bidens. Is this the beginning of something? Then President Trump making a major move halfway around the world that has even some of his strongest supporters in the Senate calling for him to reverse course. Stay with us. Back with the politics lead this afternoon, a fourth Senate Republican called out, to a degree, President Trump for pushing China and Ukraine to investigate his domestic political rival, Joe Biden. Senator Rob Portman of Ohio told the Columbus Dispatch, quote, the president should not have raised the Biden issue on that call, period. Mild, sure, but most Republicans remain unwilling to say anything at all. When Utah Republican Senator Mitt Romney criticized the president's request, President Trump attacked him repeatedly. And as CNN's Dana Bash now reports, that attack is now serving as an example to others in the GOP. Most Republicans are so unsure about how to play this, they're in virtual hiding. And the few who are speaking out, well, listen to House GOP leader Kevin McCarthy this morning. You watched what the president said. He's not saying China's investigate. Actually, he did. Listen. China should start an investigation into the Biden. Some Republicans tried to explain that away with a different tactic, deflect, claiming Trump was just kidding. Well, I, I doubt if the China comment was serious, to tell you the truth. CNN contacted more than 80 GOP congressional offices about the president inviting China to investigate his political rival. Barely a handful responded, most notably Mitt Romney, who said... The president's brazen and unprecedented appeal to China and to Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden is wrong and appalling. In response, the president went after Romney, calling him pompous and a fool, clearly intended as a warning to other Republicans weighing whether to speak out. It didn't stop Maine's Susan Collins, who did criticize the president, which plays well with Democrats she needs to win re-election in her blue state. She said... The president made a big mistake by asking China to get involved in investigating a political opponent. But she also echoed Trump's loyalists pummeling the House Democrat leading the impeachment probe. The chairman of the House Intelligence Committee misrepresented and misled people about what was in the transcript. Mitch McConnell, also on the ballot in 2020, is raising money for his Kentucky race with a promise to protect the president. All of you know your constitution. The way that impeachment stops is when a Senate majority with me as majority leader. McConnell's campaign aides argue that impeachment is galvanizing the GOP base as much as the 2018 Kavanaugh nomination fight, which contributed to several Democratic Senate defeats. Colin Powell, never a Trump fan, all but called Republicans cowardly. They need to get a grip. And when they see things that are not right, they need to say something about it. Some Republicans, like Rob Portman of Ohio, are now starting to follow a roadmap laid out by Fox's Tucker Carlson, who penned an op-ed admitting the president should not have encouraged a foreign leader to investigate his political opponent, but said that is not an impeachable offense. A one GOP lawmaker told me today that, like Rob Portman, he thinks the president's call to Ukraine's leader and comments about China were, quote, totally inappropriate. But he also told me he isn't ready to say that publicly yet, Jake, because he knows 
that he's not sure, he said, if there's, quote, another jack in the box out there. So he's reluctant to go too far in defending the president. And he told me a lot of his colleagues tell him that they agree. All right, Dana Bash, thank you uh, so much. Uh, Jen Psaki, let me let me go to the quote that we heard in that piece uh, from a campaign consultant for Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who's on the ballot next November. Mm -hmm. Quote, no issue has motivated Republican donors like this since Kavanaugh, the Supreme mm -hmm. Court battle over Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, are you afraid of that? I mean, I know you support impeaching the president or the mm -hmm. investigation, at, at least. Are you afraid that on behalf of Democrats that this actually might galvanize uh, the Republican base? I'm certain it will galvanize a portion of the ba a base. But it's important to remember that McConnell is running in Kentucky. He is up for re-election, as you mentioned, in 2020. Uh, that's a state where Donald Trump is incredibly popular. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be an easy hurdle for Democrats to defeat him, but Democrats have a pretty good candidate, um, and they're raising a lot of money on things like selling Moscow Mitch material. So, you know, he's feeling some heat on the ground. What was interesting to me about the story and some of the reporting on this is that they're spending a lot of money on online, which is smart, um, mm -hmm. digitally. It's not the same message that Mitch McConnell is delivering about how he's going to approach the process here, right? He's saying, I'll stop impeachment online, appealing to the base, trying to raise money. But here he's saying, I'll abide by the Senate process. That's probably smart politically. I don't know if he'll get caught up in that. But long story short, I'm not scared. Mitch McConnell is running in a very red state. He has to keep that in mind. If he wants to keep the majority, be the majority leader, he needs to keep his seat as well. And, and, and Chairman Rogers, let me just ask you, <clears throat> it doesn't really seem to me to be all that difficult to say that no politician should be able to lean on a foreign country for an investigation into their political rival. This is not some crazy revelation. I mean, that would just be complete chaos and the end of free and fair elections in the United States. And yet we only have four Republican senators out of 53, is it, that are even willing to acknowledge that that's wrong? Yeah. Well, I think they're probably internally acknowledging publicly, it's wrong though, and publicly, yeah. trying to figure out a way to communicate it. And I think they would be wise to come out and so talk about, hey, listen, this, we think this behavior is inappropriate. Uh, and we're going to talk to the president about it. We think he ought to go in a different way and then go off onto their positive message of all the good things that are happening. I think there's a way for them to do this. I don't think being silent for much longer is, is probably a good path for them. They will get questions back home. They're going to get questions here. You might as well take it on head on. And again, you don't have to throw the president under the bus if you're one of those Republicans. You just have to say, hey, this particular activity and this particular uh, his expression to do these things, which I, by the way, I think are, are terrible uh, and completely inappropriate. Yeah. He, they ought to be able to have some version of that so people understand, listen, we don't think this is appropriate. It shouldn't be the norm. It's not something that we're going to uh, say is okay in the future. And we'll take up those discussions with the president trying to steer him in a better direction. And you see another thing, uh, another phenomenon, as Dana noted in the PCC, Republicans either just outright denying that President Trump said things that he is on camera saying, yeah. Kevin McCarthy saying, well, he, he didn't call for China to investigate the Bidens. That's like almost a word for word quote. Right. And then you have all these other people saying, oh, I think he was just joking. There's no evidence that he was joking. Yeah, I mean, I tend to believe that treating people like they're morons is not the best strategy, just in general, as Republicans are crafting their messaging. It's a little alarming when like Tucker Carlson is out there with the best messaging we have seen yet for Republicans, which is to say that this was, the president should not have done this. We need to have free and fair elections and you need to behave like we have free and fair elections. But this isn't worthy of impeachment. That's the Tucker Carlson line. It is the best one that anyone has come up with so far. But I think this gives you an insight into how terrified members of Congress are from the president's party of the president. I mean, Mitt Romney came out there and said this behavior was appalling and the president lost his mind and spent the weekend tweeting at Mitt Romney while Mitt was at a pumpkin patch with his grandkids, like living his dream. So I think there are a lot of Republicans who are legitimately afraid of that tweet. They're afraid of what it's going to do to their fundraising. They're afraid of what it's going to do to the base. And that's part of the reason that we've seen the silence so far. So Republicans who dismissed the president's request to China as a joke, like Marco Rubio, um, have, have now been tweeting this. This is what Senator Rudy, Rubio tweeted earlier today. POTUS asking China to investigate Biden is wrong, but it isn't going to happen. How can he assert that? Why? I don't understand. Where, where does he get that? In? Where does he get that? From? So that's now the fourth um, approach that they've said. First was he's joking. 
Second was uh, the Democrats are partisan. Third was, well, it's OK. And now it's, it's just not going to happen. I think what you're seeing is the fact that they simply just don't have a strategy here, a coherent strategy um, that. So look, compare this to the Democrats right now. Right. You have Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff doing press conferences alone with a very targeted, very narrow message for where they're going. The Republicans are just sort of all over the place because, again, as Sarah said, they are just afraid of the president. He has a stranglehold on the party. And I think, frankly, what you're seeing is the death of the Northeastern moderate um, and sort of the, the voice within the Republican Party that would have challenged a president 20 years ago, just not there anymore. All right, everyone, stick around. we got more to talk about. I guess none of President Trump's advisors told him a member of Congress can't be impeached. We're fact-checking some of the president's claims on Twitter. Stay with us. Soji Yama of Japan. And also on our politics lead today, President Trump on yet another Twitter tear, slamming everyone and everything surrounding the impeachment inquiry, the Bidens, the whistleblower, uh, Chairman Adam Schiff, and adding to his long list of lies and false claims about all of these subjects. CNN's Daniel Dale fact checks President Trump for a living. That's his actual job. And he joins me now. Daniel, President Trump uh, tweeted, quote, the first so-called secondhand information whistleblower got my phone conversation almost completely wrong. So now word is they are going to the bench and another, quote, whistleblower is coming in from the deep state also with secondhand Info. Wow, there's a lot to unpack in that. But let's just start with the idea. Is the whistleblower claim completely wrong, as the president says? N not at all, Jake. The whistleblower had a three bullet point list about this call. And all three of those bullet points were effectively corroborated by the transcript or the rough transcript released by the White House itself. So let's let's go through all three. Number one was that Trump pushed Ukraine's president to investigate the Bidens. Correct. True. Yes. Trump pushed the president of Ukraine to investigate this debunked Ukraine server conspiracy theory. Correct. True, Number yeah. three was Trump pushed Zelensky to speak to his own lawyer Giuliani and the attorney general Barr. That's correct as well. Now the one caveat, Trump seems to take issue with the whistleblower saying this was pressure. Trump says, oh, it was a, it was a friendly talk, friendly request. So he can quibble with the use of the word pressure. But in terms of the substance of those allegations, all of them have been confirmed. Not to mention the White House has acknowledged on background that the transcript was then put in the secret f file server. Sure. Exactly. Which is also in the whistleblower complaint. It, it, it is. So t Trump tweeted that he thinks that Speaker Pelosi and Chairman Adam Schiff should be impeached. Uh, fact check that for us. Jake, there is no, as you know, there is no impeachment for members of the House. Members of the House can do impeaching of other people, like the president. They can be expelled, but not impeached. And Trump also got wrong the reasons that he said those two should be impeached. He said they should be impeached for treason. Nothing they've done even approaches the constitutional definition of treason. And he said that Schiff illegally met, or his, his committee staff illegally met with the whistleblower. It is routine for the House Intelligence Committee to meet with potential whistleblowers. Nothing about this is illegal at all. And then lastly, the president also referenced this picture of uh, former Vice President Joe Biden golfing. Uh, let's put it up there if we can, which was also misleading. It, it was, yeah. So, so Trump said that uh, this photo showed Joe Biden golfing with the, quote, company boss of Burisma, the Ukrainian natural gas firm. The gentleman in question, Devin Archer, was a longtime business associate of Biden's son, Hunter Biden, who was also on the board of directors, like Hunter Biden was. A board member is not the company boss. So again, Trump misidentified someone to try to serve his political purposes. It's almost as if he doesn't really have a high regard for facts and uh, truth. Almost, Jake. All right, Daniel Dale, thanks so much. Coming up, breaking news. We just learned about the extreme measures some House Democrats are considering to protect the identity of the whistleblower. What are those measures? That's next. Now some breaking news now in our politics lead and a sign of just how much bipartisanship has evaporated in the House of Representatives. House Democrats are considering going to extraordinary lengths to keep the identity of the intelligence community whistleblower secret. And according to the Washington Post, they want to keep it secret from their Republican colleagues. That includes possibly having the whistleblower testify from a secret location and then obscuring his or her ver voice and appearance, according to sources talking to CNN, first reported by the Washington Post. CNN's Manu Raju is live on Capitol Hill for us. And, and Manu, this is all over concerns that Republicans may, or at least a Republican, may leak the identity of the whistleblower. Well, it's a large measure about the president response to how the president has really gone after the whistleblower and concerns about the whistleblower's safety. Now, what I'm told from multiple people who, are, who have been, had discussions about this process or involved in this process is that they're concerned that this 
person's name could leak to the press, and that person, then the whistleblower could find him or herself in some jeopardy, and be in potential harm because of the way that the president and others have gone after the credibility of this whistleblower, whose complaint, of course, has roiled the Trump presidency. Now, I'm told uh, from multiple sources who are involved in the in these discussion that the measures that are being discussed include uh, doing this on an off-site location, limiting the number of people who could actually interview uh, this the whistleblower, disguising the whistleblower's voice, preventing them from actually seeing the identity of the whistleblower with their own eyes. They're looking at all different options uh, in, in perhaps even avoiding bringing him here to him or her here to Capitol Hill, where perhaps that person's identity could be seen, although there are ways around the Capitol to avoid being seen. But nevertheless, that is what, what is now under dis consideration. At the moment, though, the focus of the House Intelligence Committee is to bring in others who are maybe aware of the Ukraine matter, others who are involved in the fallout of the president's ask to investigate Joe Biden. But there is still very high interest among Democrats to bring in the whistleblower. They just need to figure out how to protect his or her identity. Jake. All right, Manaraju on Capitol Hill, thanks so much. Uh, well, we have the former chairman of the House Intelligence Committee here uh, and uh, former chairman Rogers. Obviously, no decision has been made. So this is not what's happening. But uh, what do you make of it? I mean, the idea that uh, House Democrats are so wary that some House Republicans would leak the identity of the whistleblower. President Trump's been demanding to know his identity, that they might not even uh, share his or her identity. That's, that's pretty striking. It is. I'm going to throw the red flag here a minute. Um, the very fact that they released the witness with the whistleblower statement told me they weren't really thinking about the whistleblower protection up front. So I, I think when you engage in these sharp-elbowed partisan attacks, n nothing benefits. That being said, I do believe the whistleblower uh, deserves to have his, his or her identity protected in this particular case. Having it leak out that we don't trust the Republicans to do this, so we're going to create this regime not to do it, I, I think is absolutely absurd. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you want a partisan investigation, that's exactly how you're going to get one. And that's exactly how people outside of this town will think of this investigation. I think they're shooting themselves in the foot. I think they think they're going to get some short-term benefit from this. That's wrong. What they need to do is set the rules, mm -hmm. say that they want to protect this particular whistleblower. There's lots of ways you can do it. I brought witnesses into the committee when I was chairman in ways that d did not disclose their identity to the public or yeah. the press. We were able to get that in. There are ways to do that. I would recommend if they think it's this hot, then go ahead, find an off-site location, which you cannot deny both parties the opportunity to go through an investigation. And by the way, if the facts are good, you might turn a few hearts on this either way, Democrats yeah. or Republicans. Jen Psaki, let me ask you, the ranking Republican on the House Intelligence Committee is Congressman Devin Nunes, who a lot of Democrats look at and say he is more allegiant to President Trump than he is to anything else. Would you trust Devin Nunes with the identity of the whistleblower? I don't think any Democrat in Congress is trusting Devin Nunes with the identity of the whistleblower, hence is the problem. I mean, uh, Mike Rogers is not the chairman of the Intelligence Committee uh, right now. It might be different if he was. Um, right now, Democrats are looking at how people like Devin Nunes and others on the committee, not every member, but certainly enough members, that they're concerned that they would uh, choose Donald Trump over the protections and the safety of the whistleblower. Now, I do think, to be fair, there are other factors here as well, including they don't want to chill this for other whis potential whistleblowers or other people who come forward. They want to show that they can protect the person, keep their identity safe, or do everything they can so that other people may come forward. That's a factor here as well. And, pre and precedents being set. I mean, you know, if this happens against Republicans, then when Republicans take the House back, Will they do it to Democrats? That's something everybody has to think about. Everyone stick around. It's not every day that Mitch McConnell disagrees with President Trump, but the presidential decision that led to the Senate Majority Leader sending a warning to the White House is our next story. Stay with us. We have some breaking news for you in our world lead today. President Trump just moments ago addressed his decision to pull U.S. forces out of the Syrian border with Turkey. On Syria, on withdrawing forces yeah. from Syria, why are you siding with an authoritarian leader and not our Kurdish allies? Well, I'm not siding with anybody. Uh, we've been in Syria for many years. You know, Syria was supposed to be a short-term hit. Republicans and Democrats sharply rebuking that decision by the president, saying that it leaves the Kurds, who have been reliable U.S. allies in the region, vulnerable to a massacre by Turkey. Senator Lindsey Graham called the move a betrayal to Kurdish forces, while Trump's former 
UN ambassador Nikki Haley said the decision would be leaving the Kurds to die. CNN's Nick Payton Walsh is covering the story from Turkey, but let's start with CNN's Barbara Starr, who's live for us at the Pentagon. Barbara, how are leaders there taking this sudden policy shift? Well, look, Jake, the public claim is that they knew all about it, that they were not blindsided by the president's decision. But make no mistake, there is deep concern here at the Pentagon on what will happen to the Kurds now and the extent to which the U.S. military will once again be seen as deserting a vital ally at a critical time. As you say, even Republicans now joining the chorus against the president's decision. And surprisingly, one of those was Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who said, and let me quote part of this, a precipitous withdrawal of U.S. forces from Syria would only benefit Russia, Iran, and the Assad regime, and it would increase the risk that ISIS and other terrorist groups regroup. The president, on the other hand, earlier today tweeting very strongly about defending his decision. And you only have to listen to what he had to tweet, saying, if Turkey does anything that I, in my great and unmatched wisdom, consider to be off, li off limits, I will totally destroy and obliterate the economy of Turkey. Remember, Turkey is a NATO ally. It's a small group so far of U.S. forces that have been withdrawn. But the one of the feelings is if Turkey was going to cross the border and launch this incursion, it's a difficult position for them. They are there as a deterrent, but they also can't be caught in the crosshairs. Jake? Okay, Barbara Starr. Let's go now to CNN's Nick Payton Walsh in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, Nick, Kurdish forces depend on U.S. troops for protection. Uh, what's the reaction from the Kurds to this move? I mean, they've said they're disappointed, but that is a vast understatement. But I have to tell you, this extraordinary moment of betrayal, I think it's fair to say, uh, as how many Syrian Kurds feel this has been telegraphed, something Donald Trump said he wouldn't do about his foreign policy moves. But he did say he might do this, then back down. Now he still might possibly put U.S. troops out of the way uh, of this potential Turkish move. It hasn't happened yet. And as Barbara said, there are possibly a couple of dozen U.S. troops who've moved back from the border at this point. And it does appear the U.S. is still controlling the airspace. So that does make an Im immediate Turkish incursion a difficult one. The first thing the Syrian Kurds are going to probably do is have to start thinking about moving their forces who are protecting uh, the rest of the population there from ISIS prisoners and ISIS displaced in large camps there, moving them towards fighting positions. And of course, the larger question too, what of the broader alliance between the Syrian Kurds and the US forces there? That seems to be shattered. There's been a long term kind of uneasy accommodation the Syrian Kurds have had with the Syrian regime and their Russian backers so close, often at great tension across their demarcation lines there as well. Many, I think, think the Syrian Kurds may have picked up the phone already to Damascus and Moscow. Their backers may be an alliance there, and that's just going to increase the capacity for bloodshed and tension as the U.S. debate their position in the days ahead. At this stage, though, Jake, nothing actually on the ground has changed apart from those troops moving back and a massive symbolic blow for U.S. leadership in the region. Jake? All right, Nick Payton Walsh in Istanbul. Thank you so much. Uh, let's chat about this. And uh, Chairman Rogers, you did all the classified Kurds coordination with the Obama administration leading up to the policy of open support uh, for the Kurds. Um, are you worried that the Turks will massacre the Kurds because of this move? Oh, absolutely. They're going to try to kill as many Kurds as they possibly can. This has been a festering wound with the Turks for a long time. But remember, we trained the, the Kurds. We gave them mission direction, meaning we said, go here and do these things to, to, to wipe out ISIS. Matter of fact, the President of the United States bragged about how fast they went across Syria to, to get rid of ISIS. Well, thank you to the Kurds for making that possible. I think when you look at everything going on today, when you talk about Russia or China, this is far worse. This will be more devastating. It's already going to have an impact with our allies and how we do interactions in the Middle East. And you're going to have the consequences of real people who have been loyal to the United States and risk their lives in really difficult circumstances to fight the fight against ISIS, who is threatening the United States. This, to me, is a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, and President Trump says, you know, we need to get out of these forever wars. And the U.S. was not supposed to be in Syria forever. What do you think? I think that's a really dangerous uh, kind of mapping over a very difficult and challenging issue. Um, 
you know, this is a case that you've just outlined. I don't think I can even add anything to that, of course, but the Kurds fought beside the United States, fought at our direction against ISIS. We, we, should, we owe them a great deal of credit and thanks for that effort. It's also just showing a complete misunderstanding or ignorance of what's happening in the region. I mean, the Kurds and the Turks have long had a great deal of tension. That's actually been a point of tension in, in our relationship with Turkey over time. Most U.S. presidents have managed that um, in different ways over time. But now we're sort of we're just leaving them, leaving them to die. I mean, and that's exactly what we're doing. And I think, you know, the, the Kurds, there's, there are bad Kurds. There are, there are the terrorist version, but there are the Kurds that have fought along, alongside us. And those are the ones that we are, are doing great damage to. So, you know, Donald Trump is oversimplifying a really more complicated issue as per usual. Um, and as a result, he's sending a message to our allies and our partners around the world that you can't rely on us, you can't depend on us, and we're not going to back you up when you help us when we need your help. And that's very dangerous in, in many other parts of the world as well. Uh, and, and, you know, this does seem to have been a, a, a tripwire for a lot of people who are willing to tolerate a lot uh, from President Trump. Take a listen to one of the hosts of uh, President Trump's favorite TV show, Fox and Friends, had to say this morning. What kind of message is that to the next ally that wants to side with us? Are you kidding me? Again, we're abandoning our most loyal allies who did all our fighters. All we did is arm them, and they did all the work. And now we say, good luck. Good luck surviving. Yeah. I mean, that show, the anchors on that show are willing to tolerate a lot from President Trump. It's interesting that that is something that, that uh, crossed the line. Well, when you talk about our nationals, this will impact our national security. It also impacts our diplomatic missions in the Middle East and really across the world, anywhere that there's trouble. When the United States goes in and we send all kinds of our folks who are pretty smart on activities there to try to have these negotiations, uh, who would trust us? Who would say, I'm with you, I'm willing to take these chances, the United States? Or are they going to say, I don't know, I don't know if you're going to be there next week or not, and we have a lot to lose.